Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ARM with Ian Brott, who's going to talk today about machine learning inferencing at the edge. Ian, we've heard a lot about inferencing at the edge. Why is it an issue? What, what sort of problems? Why do we care about it? So inference at the, at the edge is uh, emerging as a very important workload. Um, and this is because neural networks uh, happen to have this universal applicability and this kind of general ability to solve many, many different problems. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing machine learning inference kind of creep into many different problems that kind of cross the entire space of the ARM ecosystem. What do you have to think about when you're designing a chip or an architecture with for inferencing at the edge? You obviously have to deal with power, you have to deal with uh, speed, but what else is there? Yeah. So in, uh, ML inference is, is a very interesting workload. It has a few properties um, that are really worth uh, looking at when you're trying to de design IP to accelerate uh, inference at the edge. So inference at the edge requires a, a, an enormous amount of compute, a large amount of just arithmetic operations, um, coupled with uh, a tremendous amount of data movement. Now, in some cases, uh, inference on the edge will work just fine on kind of classic IP, like uh, CPUs or GPUs, uh, enabled with the right software, and that's something that, that uh, we've been doing. But if you really want that best kind of performance for machine learning on the edge, you need, to, you need to start thinking, kind of rethinking the way you design IP and, and coming up with new types of processors. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned before, uh, machine learning inference is a very important workload on the edge, and we are evolving all of our IP to basically adapt and be improved for machine learning inference, and we're enabling the software. We're adding the enabling software to do that. So this includes CPU, GPU, and new types of IP like our machine learning processor, the NPU. So what an NPU is, is a specific piece of IP designed from the ground up for machine learning. So if you really want that best possible performance per watt or performance per square millimeter, you have to start with a piece of IP designed from the ground up. And what's different about it? Is it the uh, throughput? Is it the processing speed? Yeah, it's a, it's a few different things. So I think if you, uh, the, the thing to look at with a machine learning processor or an NPU is that you really try to, um, you need to optimize for uh, three different things. So one is data movement. So when running machine learning inference, you're moving an, an enormous amount of data around. Um, so optimizing that data, that data movement uh, yields some very large gains. You need to think about uh, compression. Again, that's tied to that data movement argument. Um, and then you need to think about how you accelerate the types of operations seen in machine learning inference, like uh, convolutions and uh, the non-convolution operators. So where do things typically go wrong when you're working with these kinds of architectures? It's very easy, and it's a lot of people looked at machine learning processors kind of in the early days, and they said, well, I can just put down a whole bunch of ALUs, and I'm going to get good performance. But actually, um, that's kind of the easy part. So the, the difficult part is, you know, putting down uh, all of those ALUs and finding a way to keep them busy so that, that you actually unlock the potential of those ALUs that you've spent silicon on. And that's where kind of thinking about the full design, the software, the hardware, the data movement, that's where all of that matters. You're pretty much creating what's the equivalent of a massively parallel type of system on a chip, right? Uh, yeah, I would say that's right. And as you do that, one of the problems with mass par, mass par has always been that when you, you can split things up and you can parse it into individual processors and you can make it all work together very fast but you also have to bring it together at the end too that's that's true uh, machine learning inference uh, in general has the nice property of being relatively embarrassingly parallel so I'll, once you've kind of split everything up and you can kind of work on it there is a little bit at the end that requires some kind of synchronization but it's uh, it's relatively small compared to that massive amount of parallel work Let's drill down into this a little bit further. Okay, yeah, so uh, on the data movement side, you know, an interesting property of machine learning inference is that all of the data accesses are deterministic and can be known at compile time. Um, this is very different from CPU data accesses. So I worked on CPUs for a long time, in particular CPU memory systems, and a huge percentage of the effort in CPU memory systems is around designing a cache subsystem that can yield high performance in the context of non-deterministic access patterns. You don't know what address you're going to access next. That's not the case for machine learning inference. You actually know at compile time 
how you're going to traverse arrays. You can even choose and manipulate how you're going to do that. So that radically changes the memory system. So while a lot of people might come to a machine learning processor with the framework of, oh yeah, let's build a cache, caches are what I know, that's actually not what you want. And instead, instead, what you want is actually some sort of uh, SRAM coupled with a smart DMA that allows you to take advantage of these deterministic access patterns. So the way a memory system might work inside a machine learning processor or an NPU is actually all of the accesses, the memory access patterns are, are created by the compiler. And the DMA then just might read a command stream that brings data in, processes it, and then sends it out. This is very different from how a CPU cache works. Another thing that happens in machine learning is the algorithms change on an almost weekly basis, if not a daily basis. How do you keep up with that? Yeah, so, so that's, a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, in particular, in the ML inference uh, domain, which is um, you know, where we're focused, uh, there is a lot of uh, constant around convolutions and kind of the arithmetic heavy operations. But you do see some churn in the non-convolution operators. Those are kind of, you're seeing new operators invented. They yield slightly better accuracy. And you need to have a plan for those. That's actually um, this third bullet here. So you need to have some sort of acceleration for convolutions and other operators. So a, an, a good NPU architecture should have some sort of fl flexibility and programmability that allow you to add support for new operators as they come along. And they're invented by the research community. Compression is one piece of this. How does that fit into this? Yeah, so th this is particularly interesting. So I talked about kind of the deterministic uh, data movement. Uh, something that's also interesting about machine learning inference workloads is the type of dynamic data patterns that you see in the weights. So the weights are the neural network models and the activations. So the activations are kind of the one is the input image and then the results of the uh, processing that image through multiple layers of the neural network. Uh, so within ARM, uh, we have a very successful GPU line, the Mali GPU line, and we have a lot of experience around uh, compression technologies, because compression technologies are very common uh, in the GPU space. Um, so similarly, you want to have compression technologies in, in your NPU, but, you, but the data patterns look different than what you might see in a GPU or in other areas. So you really need to design compression technologies from the ground up for machine learning data. How does that, how does that differ? What's yeah. changed? So let, let me show you a simple example. So um, now I'm gonna try to draw a very simple picture here. So let's say you have a, a, a cat as an input to uh, your neural network, a picture of a cat. That's the first input. And as this, as this image goes through the network, it, it changes because it's going through multiple different nonlinear filters. And the, the, at first it might look like just a high pass filtered version of the cat, but as you go along through the network, you're going to see sharp edges, you're going to see extracted features, you're gonna see very different types of images. So from a compression technology perspective, you want a technology that one can both compress that original version of the cat, but also compress what you see maybe in the middle of the neural network, which might just be, you know, sharp lines or a circle or things like that. So you really need to take into account the life of the activation throughout the neural network when designing your activation compression technology. How much overhead is there in terms of compression decompression? Yeah, so a, a lot of this can be done relatively simply in hardware so that the cost in hardware is very small and the gains are tremendous because you can use uh, as much as half of your energy just sending data back and forth to DRAM and if you can cut that you know, by a half or by two thirds, you're saving a huge amount of energy. So your trade-offs are compression versus uh, running things without be being compressed. Also IO, if you are running um, compressed versus uh, non-compressed, and also in terms of power, uh, how much does it take to do one versus the other and speed as well, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of different a lot of different trade-offs here. So you know, adding the compression, you want to do it in a way that doesn't hurt performance. You want to do it in an area efficient way that doesn't cost a lot of power. And the gains you're seeing there is one, you're going to save a huge amount of energy on the uh, external interfaces going to memory, and you're going to go faster actually in the cases where you're limited by your memory bandwidth. Because there are so many applications and machine learning is being applied to almost everything these days, um, does, it, does one architecture work across all of them or do you need to make changes in each one? 
That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's, it's kind of early days, so it's hard to have a, uh, a really conclusive response to that. But one of the nice things about machine learning is that um, fundamentally underneath, you're just seeing these neural networks built out of the same components, and then that's being applied to different problems. So the main difference you see across problems is not the computation, but rather just the throughput requirements. So the throughput requirements for a self-driving car machine learning are going to be way higher than doing some uh, simple speech recognition in your smart speaker. So as you go into the market uh, with this type of architecture, what are you hearing back from potential customers? What are they looking for? Is it the lowest power? Is it the fastest performance? Yeah, yeah so it, for the, the markets where, for area, where areas um, where people are really looking for a dedicated piece of IP like an NPU, a lot of the feedback is just basically a requirement for just insatiable compute. So give, give us as much compute as you can and as low as power as you can, as high performance as you can. So there's really an enormous demand for compute here. So how about in terms of customization of the architecture? Are, is there a demand for that because the algorithms are constantly changing? Yeah. So there's a lot of ways for, uh, when, when folks are talking about customization, what they're really looking for is, is differentiation. They want to do things different and better than their competitors. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. So you can differentiate on the type of data you use to train your neural network. You can differentiate on your neural network architecture and the type of operators that you use. So where that comes down to us from a request is really adding support for, for new types of operators or operators that our partners think are important to their particular workloads. Ian Broth, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.